We're speaking today on the business of biomarker implementation. So I'm a consultant clinical biochemist. I've been working at the Christie Hospital in Manchester in England for the last 10 years now. It's a tertiary oncology center. It's a, a very nice campus. We have the, the MCRC, which is the Manchester Cancer Research Center just across the road on campus. And it's a fantastic opportunity to collaborate with researchers, clinician scientists, and to, to develop uh, translational research and biomarker implementation across the, the, the roadmap for implementation. I'm an, also an honorary lecturer at the University of Manchester, and we have close collaborations with the Manchester Academic Health Sciences Centre and, more lately, the Stoller Biomolecular Discovery Institute. Uh, so today my talk will consist of uh, a couple of aspects on the test evaluation cycle. Uh, first I'll introduce the, the work of the EFLM's working group for test evaluation, for which my, myself and Sfera sit on. Uh, the challenges and opportunities in this, uh, this area, and some of the practical tools that the working group has developed to assist the biomarker pipeline. Uh, this will be in the context of the, the changing IVD regulatory landscape, including aspects impacting on laboratory de developed methodology and some future aspects which I'll touch on in terms of my translational research work. So the working group itself, I've been a member of the working group now for around seven years. It's a collaboration between the EFLM and the Australasian Association for Clinical Biochemistry and it, it truly is a, a multi-stakeholder working group. We have collaboration between laboratory medicine professionals epidemiologists, um, health economists more lately, and also IVD industrial partners in the form of Abbott, Roche Diagnostics, uh, and Thermo Fisher. And the aim really is to improve health outcomes for patients by uh, improved diagnostic test development, guidance, and implementation. And through that, we provide guidance and also practical tools to that end. So you, you will all have seen the brain-to-brain the -brain loop as biochemists, you'll be familiar with this aspect. And just to put into context the work of the EFLM, there are many working groups and task and finish groups set up along this brain-to-brain -brain pathway. And the working group for test evaluation specifically focus on, focuses on the uh, analytical aspects, the analysis of the, te of the uh, sample. In terms of the challenges and opportunities within this uh, field, in the laboratory, we have issues arising in terms of the introduction of, of new tests, which have poor evidence base, variation in the adoption of new tests, also over and under utilization of tests, and there's a lot of room for development of demand management, demand optimization, diagnostic stewardship, but also there's a slow adoption of new tests along the, the biomarker translational pathway. And we need to ultimately provide tests which have a clinical benefit for the patient by allowing um, clinical management decisions to be based upon the information that they hold and ultimately to improve the clinical pathway to improve patient outcomes. So as I say, the test, the test needs to provide uh, uh, information to improve the, the clinical management decision from the patient's perspective. That will ultimately be linked to the patient outcome. However, as Hugo mentioned in his previous presentation, these direct um, links are often very difficult to evidence in practice. And if you remember the first EFLM strategic conference in Milan in 2014, you'll know the three-tier approach, model 1A being direct outcome data. So it is very difficult, but that's ultimately what we should be aiming for, for, for tests which have a, a direct uh, impact on clinical decision making. And this paper in PLOS One showed uh, through a, a clinical survey that IVD testing it takes place in around 75% of patients in, in the cardiac setting. And it concluded that IVD test results in guided clinical decisions in 66% of cases. So it just illustrates the importance of laboratory testing in general. This was an editorial that we've uh, published in, in the September edition of the Annals of Clinical Biochemistry. And the problems are varied along the translational pathway. The, the amount of translational research and biomarker research going on increases exponentially year on year. There's a, a huge amount of uh, resource, finance, 
placed into these biomarker research settings, and a lot of papers are, are, are published as a, as a consequence of that. But in a paper from uh, the Epma Journal in 2013, it illustrated the year-on-year -year increase in the number of publications in the biomarker field. Yet there seems to be a plateau in terms of the number of biomarker patents, and if you take that as a, a surrogate of translational uh, uh, research from academia to clinical practice, you'll see that there's, there's a translation and inertia, so something is not quite right. And this is evidenced further by the fact that only 1.5 protein diagnostic biomarkers are FDA cleared per year, according to, to Anderson and colleagues in 2010. And George Post, writing in Nature, really uh, described this as a drop in the ocean. So there's uh, hundreds of thousands of research papers um, describing thousands of, of novel biomarkers. But in practice, in clinic, we only usually measure around 100 of these. And that's pretty reflective of uh, my laboratory's repertoire, pretty much. So there is a, an issue from translating research from the research laboratory into the clinical laboratory. And this has also been described as the valley of death from biomedical research, developing new IVD assays, and implementation and adoption in clinical practice. And we somehow need to bridge this gap in the translational pipeline. And again, in a Q&A from clinical chemistry, um, what is wrong with clinical proteomics? The main issues from this paper found that despite a 15-year effort, no major disease biomarkers have been discovered using mass spectrometry-based proteomics. And the main obstacle is well-designed clinical studies that ask the most clinical, clinically important questions. So what is the unmet clinical need for a novel biomarker? Where is its role within the clinical pathway? And more recently, Lucy Parker and colleagues wrote in Clinical Chemistry in 2018 regarding diagnostic biomarkers, now we're moving from, clinical, from discovery to clinical application. They analyzed over 4,000 articles uh, citing 107 different molecular and omics tests which were published in the year 2006. And they looked over the 10 years subsequent to that, so between 2006 and 2016. And they found that less than 10% of the 44 proteomics tests um, uh, described actually made progress towards clinical application, less than 10%. And 20% of these studies, 20% of these 4,000 plus articles, actually constituted research waste. And few tests progressed towards clinical application in the 10 years following their initial discovery. So what can we do about this? Well, as the, the test evaluation working group, we've put together our scoping paper, which includes key definitions in this specialist area, and also a test evaluation framework, a cyclical framework to help guide test evaluation from biomarker to medical test. And this was published now back in 2014, some five years ago in Clinica Chemica Acta. This is the pathway, this is the cyclical framework and it, it bears a striking resemblance to the atomium in Brussels. And you can see that the aspects of test evaluation, the five key aspects of test evaluation are driven at the center by the clinical pathway. And that's very important because we need to consider the, the, the novel diagnostic test purpose and the test role within that clinical pathway. And that then guides in an iterative, iterative process the uh, five components of test evaluation. So this is the framework for IVD medical testing. As I say, the pathway constitutes the role and the purpose within the clinical pathway. And for that, we need to perform pathway mapping as well. So the scoping paper which, which we published described key definitions of those five key components. And I'll take analytical performance as an example, we can see in literature that it's not always called analytical performance, but there may be related terms, analytical validity, technical efficacy, and also an explanation or a definition of that term. So for analytical performance, it would be the ability of an in vitro medical assay to conform to predefined quality specifications. And a, an example for each of these five test components. So for analytical performance, we've used the high sensitive troponin uh, assay where we need equal to or less than 10% CV at the 99th population percentile. And our test evaluation framework was actually used as a, an audit tool by the, uh, the Oxford uh, group, the University of Oxford in the UK, when they were looking at point of care uh, gaps in test evaluation through uh, a systematic review of horizon scanning reports. <clears throat> 
So they took our pathway, they included comparative clinical effectiveness, and they found that from a review, a review of Horizon scanning report papers, the majority had good clinical performance demonstrated, but when it came to comparative cost effectiveness, uh, comparative clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness, sorry, the, they were only demonstrated in, in around 10% or less than 10% of, of the published data. And critically, they found that the test evaluation cycle actually took around nine years, a median of nine years to complete that full cycle. So going back to the test evaluation framework where we've got the clinical pathway at the heart, the test purpose describes the actual intended use of that, of that test within the clinical pathway. So it could be a diagnostic test, it could be a screening test, it could be a prognostic or predictive test. An example would be HbA1c in the diagnosis of, of diabetes mellitus. And then the role of the test. So where is that test positioned within the clinical pathway? Is it an add-on test, such as a, a free T3 if you have abnormal uh, TFT results in a certain clinical scenario? Is it a replacement test, so troponin, contemporary troponin assays have largely supplanted CKMB measurements these days, or it could be a triage test, and I've given the example of uh, B-type natriuretic peptide in the uh, prior to echocardiography in the congestive heart failure pathway. And pathway mapping is hugely important because it often helps to illustrate the complexity of these pathways, and no, no one stakeholder has the same uh, um, viewpoint of a clinical pathway, so it helps to engage all stakeholders. It helps you to, to visualize the extent of any clinical problem within a pathway. And also, if it's a new biomarker or biomarker testing strategy, it helps you to quantify that impact of that innovation or that implementation. So it really is useful in terms of clinical audits and continuous quality improvements and capturing that data. Clinical pathways are also really useful for sharing best practice as I've mentioned, diagnostic stewardship and opportunities there, and also for standardization. And that is very important in these days as we have larger and larger pathology networks, uh, which are, uh, encompass a lot of different laboratories, various different hospitals. So ideally, you want to standardize best practice. And the only way to benchmark that, ideally, is through clinical care pathways. And then, again, going back to our test evaluation framework, once you have deciphered the test purpose and the test role within the clinical pathway, that really helps you to divine and, and address the unmet clinical need. And when we looked in the literature, it was difficult to find a, a particular definition for unmet need, and we, we therefore developed one here. So it's any missing or inadequately performing component of a clinical pathway. So you really need to be asking what the clinical management problem is, and whether that new novel biomarker can address that, that problem within the clinical pathway. We've published quite extensively in this area um, the EFLM Working Group for Test Evaluation. Here are a couple of our recent publications, the first one in, in CCA, uh, Biomarker Development Targeting and Clinical Needs, and more lately in the Journal of the IFCC. So if you know your unmet clinical need within the pathway, it can help biomarker development at the very early stages, and therefore can reduce research waste. It can help funding for this new test, be it through policymakers, commissioners, um, uh, different funding bodies, and certainly within the UK we've had positive experience there. It can guide desired analytical performance specifications and clinical performance specifications. Uh, I know Professor Sandberg will be talking on that area more in tomorrow's session. But ultimately, uh, the new test should guide medical decisions and lead to improved patient outcomes. So how can we help to address this. Well, we've, we've put a, a practical uh, toolbox together to help identify and validate unmet clinical need. It's a four-step approach that we've taken. Step one is identifying the unmet clinical need. Step two is verifying that unmet need. Step three is validating the purpose or the intended use of that test. And step four is actually assessing feasibility for implementation into clinical practice and what are the potential unintended consequences. So it's taking the broader view. Within those four steps, we've broken that down into 14 key questions. Uh, step one, in terms of identifying unmet need, this is uh, around what is the clinical management problem and the desired outcome. Step two, verifying the unmet need. Is there an existing solution? And that, help, that is very useful to, to map out the current clinical pathway so you can actually assess the evidence. Step three, validating the intended use. Would the biomarker contribute to the solution that you've envisaged? 
And step four, feasibility. Is the biomicro solution uh, feasible in practice? And that's from both commercial, economic, technical and organisational standpoints and any other broader aspects. Are there any unintended consequences, be them ethical, legal, etc.? Um, with the, the collaboration of uh, Dr. Daniel Rajdal here at the Charles University, who uh, was previously chair of the, the FLM Working Group for uh, Distance Education and E-Learning, Daniel has very helpfully um, transformed our unmet clinical needs assessment tool into an interactive checklist available on the uh, EFLM e-learning website. Uh, Daniel's also put together a video to, to talk you through the steps included. It's very user friendly. We have got uh, a tutorial, we've got pathway mapping templates and the four step unmet clinical needs uh, checklist and we provide model answers for each of those. Here's how it looks, we've got the four steps here and it talks you through each of the 14 questions. The, um, the uh, definitions that we've placed in the scoping paper are also interactive. So if you click on a, a, a specific uh, key term such as biomarker or analytical validity, etc., that will then give you the definition and an example. So it's very user friendly, very educational. And here are the, the mapping templates. We have two mapping templates across the four steps of the pathway. Here we just provide the, the example for high sensitive troponin where we've got the target population of interest, the current pathway and the new pathway including the, the novel biomarker. Importantly we've got a link to the clinical management decisions and health outcomes, be them positive or negative. And this for me it really helps to foster collaboration and helps to facilitate discussion with, with clinical colleagues and I've used this personally at, at the Christie to help to define clinical problems and scope uh, uh, answers and, and, and address those problems. Daniel's also very uh, kindly put a discussion forum and a feedback form on there so any users can provide feedback. This is in the very early stages and we, we hope to iterate and improve the, the checklist in uh, uh, future application. And it's now starting to come through in the, in the published literature. So uh, uh, Chris de Kobach's group at Leiden University Medical Center has recently reviewed uh, personalized medicine and apolipoprotein profiling as an approach for personalized treatment of dyslipidemia. And their group have used our uh, pathway mapping exercise, looking at current practice and how new practice in terms of apolipoprotein profiling can potentially impact health outcomes. So hopefully this is being picked up by the scientific community and that should be evidenced in, in, in the coming years, hopefully. So we have these tools. Going forward, how, we can, how can we help to implement these into clinical practice? Well, we need to keep in mind the, the changing regulatory landscape of uh, in vitro diagnostics. Uh, more specifically, the new IVD reg, uh, regulation, 2017-746. This was brought into um, legal text in May 2017 and is currently undergoing a five-year transition period with full implementation by May 2022. Within this uh, big document, it must be stressed that uh, IVD medical tests differ from other medical devices and that the risk and benefit posed to patients is a consequence of the impact on, on uh, clinical management decisions rather than direct contact as with other uh, diagnostics devices. So as a consequence of that, we've got a, a new uh, risk classification system and the, the class for which each uh, diagnostic gets allocated to is specifically focused on the intended use of that diagnostic. That diagnostic. Uh, quite importantly, the IVDR stipulates a performance evaluation plan for manufacturers, and this really chimes with our five-step test evaluation framework in that we need to provide strong evidence of clinical performance and analytical performance. And this is really a specification for the purpose or the intended use of that in vitro diagnostic. Specifically, it also includes continuing during the life cycle of the IVD, so that is post-market surveillance or post-market performance follow-up. And that is the, the planned monitoring of scientific developments and changes in medical practice by the manufacturer. So, as biochemists, you'll be familiar with, with these uh, structures here. This is uh, estrogen. This here is a selective estrogen receptor degrader. It's fluvestrant. Identical, uh, albeit with this uh, bulky aliphatic side chain, 
and this enables binding uh, and to the estrogen receptor and induces degradation. Um, we published this in February of this year in BJC. We collaborated, the laboratory collaborated with our breast oncologist and the endocrine team at the Christie, um, really to, to communicate, out, communicate, communicate out to biochemists and oncologists of the potential interference that fulvestrin has on, on immunometric assays. And we compared the gold standard laboratory developed test, which is for estradiol by a, a liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry methodology, very sensitive, down to, I think, 10 picomoles per litre. Compared this against two commercially available uh, immunoassay platforms uh, from leading industry providers, and we found there was a, a clinically significant positive bias when patients were receiving fulvestrin therapy. Fulvestrin is very hydrophobic now. It also has a very long half-life, so it sticks around in the circulation for a while. Um, these are the uh, postmenopausal estradiol cutoffs for each of the three assays. It's very important because at the Christie we have patients enrolled on multiple clinical trials at any one time. And a lot of these clinical trials, particularly in breast cancer setting, stipulate that there needs to be a, biochem a thorough biochemical assessment of, uh, patient, of the patient's menopausal status. This often includes the estradiol measurement for the clinical trials, particularly in patients under 60 years of age. So we need to get the, the measurement of estradiol absolutely right as the, the potential impact on, on clinical trial eligibility is, is all too clear to see. And we now have a pathway set up within the Christie whereby patients who are actively receiving fulvestrin or receiving fulvestrin in the last two months are referred for LCMS-MS measurement for estradiol. This leads us on nicely to laboratory developed tests. Um, Mario Plablani's lab have recently produced a report in CCA uh, of a validation model of laboratory developed methods to, ensure, to help to ensure ISO 15189 accreditation. And this, uh, this, uh, this paper is very useful because it helps to certify that the achieved performance specification of an LDT is appropriate and fit for purpose for the intended use of that test and also helps to uh, evidence compliance with, with ISO 15189 stipulations. And within this paper, they produced a validation plan, which is very useful. Critically, it includes the intended use. In this example, it's salivary cortisol measurement by uh, liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry and its indications in terms of both hypo and hypocortisolemic states. Performance characteristics, be they measurement range, LOQ, reference intervals, the typology of the test, so how that will be provided and how that will be evidenced. The time, of, the time to evaluate each of these uh, performance characteristics and importantly, acceptability criteria. So evidence-based acceptability criteria in guidelines. And this culminates in a validation certificate. And you can provide this to your, uh, accredit your accreditation assessor at your next ISO 15189 uh, site visit. Particularly useful for your LDTs. And in addition to this, uh, the working group for test evaluation has also very recently published uh, guidance on setting clinical performance specifications. This is applicable for both uh, the diagnostics industry and, and laboratory developed tests. And this was in the September issue of the annals. The, uh, the paper is peppered with examples, but it's basically a, a five-step approach and it aligns with our unmet clinical needs assessment in the fact that it shows a pathway mapping exercise and you need to take into account the purpose of the test. We've used this at the Christie as well, uh, particularly in terms of replacement tests, whereby you would benchmark against existing clinical performance. Um, we looked at conventional 24-hour uh, urine 5-hydroxyindoleacetic acid, 5-HIA measurement, for our uh, large neuroendocrine clinic, and we compared that against serum and plasma measurement of serum 5-HIAA. Uh, uh, um, through this comparison, we found almost identical clinical performance based on rock curve analysis. There was no uh, trade-off between uh, sensitivity or specificity between either matrix types. Um, we implemented that, and then as a follow-up, we performed a clinical audit after, after 12 months to uh, assess the, the uh, clinical appropriateness of testing for serum 5-HIAA. It's, not, it's a specialist test, so it's not one of the cheapest tests in the world, so we need to make sure also that it's, it's being used as appropriate within the designated clinical pathway. Um, so 5-HIA is a marker for well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, so it shouldn't be measured, firstly, in poor differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas. 
It should be measured in well-differentiated tumours at baseline, post-surgery, or if there's been a previous baseline elevation. And we had um, a colleague, a me medical student, perform a clinical audit, and he found that, in fact, we were experiencing uh, almost 60% inappropriate requesting in our clinical pathway. So as a consequence of that, we took the opportunity to uh, undertake some, some demand management, and we took a two-pronged approach. Firstly, in the hospital IT system, the electronic patient record, we provided some decision support at the front end. So the, the clinician, when they requested a, a plasma 5-HIA, a serum 5-HIA, they could give the indication. So was it a baseline assessment? Had the patient had previous surgery? So we need a, a 5-HIA within one month of CT scanning. Has there been a previous baseline elevation? And as a, as a caveat, we need to offer a, an override mechanism as well because this would then help with any, any clinical trial asynchronicity. In terms of the, the limb system, the, the LIS, we also implemented a, a minimum retest interval through a, a simple uh, logic rule. Um, we put this to 11 weeks uh, as it fitted very nicely with the patient's 12-week, uh, 3 times 28 day somatostatin injection cycle. And as a consequence of this, we, re, uh, we just recently re-audited a basic re-audit at six months just down to laboratory workload. So taking into, well, not taking into account year-on-year um, -year increases as yet, we've seen a, a demand optimization of a, a reduction of 20% of testing, which is a, a significant, also a significant cost reduction. So just to review, the performance specification needs to reflect the clinical need of the patient. It needs to be tailored to the test purpose and the test role within that specific clinical pathway. And ultimately, there needs to be a strong link between the test performance the clinical management decision, and then ultimately the patient outcome. So looking to the future, at the Christie Hospital, we are currently collaborating with uh, the Cancer Research UK. Um, so over the road at the Manchester Cancer Research Centre with the, uh, the CIUK Manchester Institute and their Biomolecular Research Centre. This is headed up by Professor Caroline Dive, who's very eminent in the field of biomarker developments. And we're looking at the, the Valtive study. This is a validation of circulating TI2 for VEGFI. TI2 is a receptor tyrosine kinase, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors such as bevacizumab. And the rationale for this is that there's an unmet need for predictive and responsive biomarkers for VEGF use in ovarian cancer. And there needs to also be uh, an improvement in the cost effectiveness of the use of VEGF inhibitors. TI2, as a circulating biomarker, has been shown to um, decrease in vascular responders. Overall response rate in ovarian cancer is around 75% of patients. If we see a decrease of 30% during uh, the nine weeks of treatment, we can ensure that, we can ensure that there's a vascular response and, and bevacizumab is having a a clinical effect in the vascular com compartment. And the aim is to validate TI2 to ISO 15189 standards for clinical decision making on bevacizumab therapy and ovarian cancer. Here is the, <clears throat> the quite complex uh, CIUK biomarker roadmap. So for, for TI2, we've undergone the, the, the rationale and the, the biomarker discovery and assay development. We now have a, a, an ELISA platform for TI2 measurements. And the next stage now is Valtiv 1 and Valtiv 2, which is the biomarker qualification stage for implementation, translational implementation into routine clinical practice within the NHS. So we've collaborated. This is uh, my hospital, the Christie Biochemistry Laboratory. We're accredited to ISO 15189. And we're working closely with CIUK Manchester Institute. We're a GCP laboratory. We want to qualify this biomarker to ISO 15180 standards as part of Valtiv 1 and confirm the criteria for a clinically significant reduction in TI2 to demonstrate vascular response to then power the subsequent uh, Valtiv 2 study, which, are, which is a randomized discontinuation trial. And in particular, we want to focus on identifying vascular non-responders so we can discontinue therapy early and offer alternative treatments. And this would ultimately complete stages one and stage two and complete the biomarker roadmap in that respect. So the take-home message is that there really is a huge opportunity for laboratory professionals to collaborate and be involved in, in biomarker translation, and we need to implement 
new clinical pathways across our laboratory profession. The acknowledgements I'd like to make are chiefly around the test evaluation working group and the team at the Christie, including the endocrinologist, the clinical biochemistry team, and close collaboration with Brian Keevil's lab at Manchester Foundation Trust for their mass spectrometry expertise. Uh, our chief clinical information officer is a radiologist, uh, Dr. Ridian Bramley, and uh, the CIUK Manchester Institute, uh, led by Caroline Dive. I would urge you all to uh, visit the AFLM website, uh, the test evaluation working group webpage. Here we have a huge resource, including our, our articles, which are downloadable, and our developing practical toolbox, which includes the link to the uh, e-learning platform um, for assessment of uh, unmet clinical needs assessment in an in interactive fashion. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.